Gold is found in a lot of places, but is it really found everywhere? Recently, Jeff Williams put out a video titled, How to Find Gold Every Time in Any Creek or Hillside. Now, does, does that mean that gold really is everywhere? Well, it's a complex thing, you know, that's where we're gonna take uh, some time to dig into that. Now, the first thing I wanna say before I even get started with this video is that this is absolutely not a criticism video for Jeff. It's not, I'm not trying to slam Jeff or criticize him in any way. Actually, you know, Jeff has made a lot of really great videos over the years and he's very popular. I know a number of you guys watch his videos and I'll be real honest, I watch his videos sometimes too, because like I say, he's done some really good ones. So this is not in any way some kind of criticism. And the truth is, yeah, other people have made similarly titled videos that would bring up the same question. And to be honest, it's a really great question. Can gold be found in any creek or on any hillside? And the truth is, Jeff and sometimes other prospector channel guys that have done similar videos, uh, they never really get around to addressing this question. So I'm gonna tackle it head on. And do you really wanna know the answer? Well, it really depends on how you take the question. Because if you look at it one way, the answer actually really is yes. It's everywhere. And if you look at it another way, uh, the answer is no, of course it's not everywhere. Uh, the answer is really complicated and that's why I can't just say, oh yes, or oh no, to, to, and you know, have a 30 second video. We're gonna dig into this and look at all the different aspects of where gold is, why gold is there, and how many places it is. We're gonna kind of do this Mythbuster style. We're gonna dig right into the question, take a look at all the different aspects and stuff, and, and then we're gonna decide, you know, is this story busted? Is it plausible? Or is it confirmed that gold really is everywhere? So stay with me through this video because we're going to take a look at a lot of different things and talk about a lot of different gold related topics and really dig into the question of can you find gold in every creek or on any hillside. Now I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector and you know my channel is about gold and gemstones and other things and stick with me through this video because I think there's a lot of good information to learn. Now, you know, I get contacted by people from various places, you know, um, you know, I live in Florida. Where are the gold bearing streams in Florida? Or I went looking for gold in, in a hillside in Kansas or Oklahoma and I didn't find anything. You know, I get questions like that. Where should I go to find gold in my own backyard? Uh, I got one from a guy who was in British Columbia, and British Columbia is a state with a lot of gold in it, but he happened to live in an area of British Columbia where there really pretty isn't much isn't a lot of gold. There's gold nearby him though. And so he brought up this question, is gold really everywhere? Well, the truth is there are traces of gold in pretty much all kinds of rocks. Pretty much all sorts of rocks, including uh, sedimentary, igneous, uh, metamorphic, uh, all different kinds of rocks have usually pretty small, though, small amounts of gold in them. And this is just something that is a fact of about, you know, how the earth is made, that the earth is not pure. So, you know, a rock that's mostly iron oxide. It may be mostly iron oxide, but it's not pure iron oxide. Uh, a sedimentary rock may be a piece of uh, schist or slate, but it's lots of different elements mixed in there. A, an igneous intrusive rock, rock, like a granite, you know, may have 20 or 30 different minerals, but even those different minerals, they're not pure either. There's little bits of, other elements mixed into the minerals. And in fact, like I say, all different kinds of rocks have really small amounts of lots of different elements. Now the elements that are more common are 
more widespread and easy to find. Iron, for example, you know, we, people talk about black sand and that sort of thing. Iron minerals, it's not because black sand is not metallic iron, it's an iron mineral. Uh, those minerals, you know, are pretty common. Black sand is pretty common stuff. Uh, it's because iron, the main element of the iron minerals like black sand, iron is the fourth most common element in the Earth's crust. And actually, if you took the whole surface of the Earth, the whole crust, it comes out to about 5.6% iron. But rarer elements like gold or platinum, that sort of thing, they're not so common. And they may be present in rocks, but only in tiny, tiny, tiny parts per billion. And I, I mean parts per billion with a B. Uh, just uh, normal rocks may have from about a half a part per billion to maybe 10 or 15 parts per billion. That's a pretty normal range and that's a really small amount, but it's not zero. And so if you compare the amount of iron in the Earth's crust to the amount of gold in the Earth's crust, it turns out that iron is 14,000 times more common than gold is. And most, most rocks have a gold concentration between a half of a part per billion and about five parts per billion. That's kind of the, the most of the rocks will fit in there. But like I say, there are other rocks with more. And, you know, let's take a look at a chart of various elements in the Earth's crust and their relative, how, how common they are, how frequently uh, these different elements are found in the rocks of the Earth's crust. Okay, so just to be clear what I mean by the Earth's crust, it's the solid surface, not the mantle, not the liquid part down below in the Earth or the solid metal core. It's just the crust on the surface that's solidified. It's the rocks we come into contact with. This diagram shows the relative abundance of the elements in the Earth's crust. And one of the things you can see is there really is just a handful, eight elements that are more than 2%, that make up like 99% of all the rocks in all the surface of the Earth. And they're basically oxygen is the big dominant one, and then silicon, aluminum and iron, and then calcium, sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Those are basically the ones that make up most rocks. And if you look at the chart, you can see there's a little tiny slice for titanium, which is a little more than a half a percent, a tiny, tiny slice for hydrogen, which is a tenth of a percent. And then all the other elements combined, all of them make for only two tenths of a percent. And that includes lead and zinc and copper. It includes all the rare earth elements, uh, carbon that our bodies are made out of, phosphorus, uh, ni uh, nitrogen, uh, all the transition metals like nickel and that sort of thing. All of those, and of course, not to forget gold and silver and even the platinum group metals, all combined only equal two tenths of a percent. And that's why rocks only have tiny, tiny traces of gold in them. Now, if I were to make a little dot on this circle that represented the amount of gold on the Earth's crust, you would find that it was so small that even if you were looking at this on a 65-inch TV, you still wouldn't be able to see the dot. I mean, look at the blue slice that says iron. I would have to divide that slice into 14. 15,000 pieces before I would get a speck small enough to be gold. And so, you know, one fourteenth thousandth of that is not going to be something that's visible on any screen. It's smaller than a pixel. So this shows you that really, although there's a handful of elements that we have a pretty decent abundance of, everything else is, you know, more rare. And, and of course there are the elements on the other end, on the really rare end of the scale, and that includes gold and the platinum group metals. Now, functionally speaking, the surface of the earth, 
the natural geologic processes of faulting, erosion, tectonic plates colliding or subducting one again uh, below the other, uh, cycles of volcanoes and volcanic eruption, and all those things working together make the geologic cycle almost like a gigantic blender. Very slow moving, you know, it's not like uh, blades of a blender that spin real fast, but because it's always turning and, uh, and going under and coming up, it is kind of, in a way, at least you could look at it that way, like a giant blender. And the water that we have on the surface of the earth and, and even below the surface of the earth in various aquifers and stuff, uh, these work to help separate and concentrate different minerals. And what, what we have for a gold deposit is something that's a natural concentration of gold that you take a rock that has a tiny trace and you kind of strip out most of that gold and you move it to some place and deposit it you get a natural concentration and almost always that involves water and very much commonly it involves sulfur as well and you end up with a gold deposit but just for comparison's sake, let's let's take a look. Um, you know, I said that rocks naturally have concentrations of maybe half a part per billion to five, some rocks more, up to maybe 20 or sometimes even a little more, even maybe up to 50 parts per billion. And but those the ones that high are less common. And so you have to think about this. This natural concentration process has to work to concentrate the gold by a factor of a hundred to even a thousand if you start with rocks that are half a part per billion. Because even the lowest of low grade open pit ores are about 500 parts per billion. Those are the super low grade types of ores. Most ores are much better than that. So really we're talking about these natural geologic processes, taking gold out of one rock and putting them in into a vein or some other type of, of deposit that concentrates the gold and you use, it ends up getting concentrated by a factor between a hundred to a thousand and sometimes even higher than a thousand times. You really have to have that kind of process to make a workable gold deposit. So there are at least tiny traces of gold in pretty much all regular rocks. But there are also many widespread parts of the United States and elsewhere on, on planet Earth where there are small amounts of gold spread over really wide areas. As an example, in the Midwest part of the US, there are huge areas in multiple states where small amounts of gold can be found because of glacial deposits um, and their original uh, hard rock hosts that had gold in them that the material's been pushed down from Canada by, by glaciers and then left in the United States and been eroded through and some of the streams and stuff that cut through these glacial deposits can have gold in them and indeed people find gold in them. Now big glaciers can dig up and scoop out and push huge amounts of rock and indeed the huge amounts of rock that have been moved from Canada down to the US have tiny amounts of gold in them and as various creeks and streams cut through these glacial gravels, they reconcentrate the original gold that's in them. So the lighter sand and clay and stuff is pushed downstream and the gold and other heavy minerals tend to stay put. The original gravel, the original glacial material is very, very, very low grade, but by the force of water and the action of, you know, various uh, uh, bends in streams, uh, boulders, other outcrops, and other things, other processes, you can form pay streaks that have enough gold that make it worthwhile for a prospector to work. 
And in fact, uh, because there are diamonds also in this part of Canada, uh, there are also the occasional diamond that's found uh, working some of these placer gravels because diamonds are heavier than average rock and they resist weathering just like the gold does. And so you end up with concentrations of heavy minerals. So you get black sand and that kind of thing, but gold and occasionally, because they're even more rare, diamonds. This type of glacial related gold is actually found in Illinois, in Indiana, Iowa, Ohio, and Nebraska, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And so like I say, uh, this gold bearing region covers a huge part of the central uh, part of the US called usually the Midwest. Let's take a look at some Midwest gold. Here's a view of some Midwest gold. Uh, you can kind of get the feel from this that it's very fine. You know, you can get little flakes and even rarely small pickers, but a lot of it is pretty dust-like and, you know, very fine flakes. And that's just how it is. The majority of the gold belongs in this class. This map shows the state outlines and uh, the dark lines, either, you know, the dark blue colored lines show the actual moraine lines of uh, the terminal moraines as they work their way down from Canada. But you can see that this glaciated area extends all the way from Western Pennsylvania, and of course, Pennsylvania isn't part of the Midwest, but Western Pennsylvania and even uh, Western New York all the way over to the Dakotas. And so, you know, this is a huge area that has potential for gold, uh, not in large amounts, but there is decent potential and there are folks that go out and find gold in these places. Now, if you want a larger discussion of this Midwest gold and more detail and stuff, I did a video on it and put it up here. Uh, you can click to it and I'll also link to it in the description down below. Uh, and you can explore this idea of Midwest gold if you've never known about it. Well, there is gold, not huge amounts, but there is gold to be found in the Midwest. And it's not just the Midwest. There are small concentrations of gold found in huge areas across the Western U.S. The Chinle Formation, which is a, a sedimentary formation with uh, rocks and clays of Triassic age, underlies about 100,000 square miles in parts of Arizona, Colorado, uh, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. There is gold in small amounts in the clays of the Chinle Formation, and it's been verified and found in many places. The gold occurs in very fine, small flakes, but can be recovered by careful panning. And in the old days, prospectors that knew about this found places where uh, little arroyos or ravines or streams cut through the uh, clay layers of the Chinle Formation and were able to uh, recover some gold because, again, the gold would be concentrated in certain areas and the old time miners could pan this gold out and recover it. It's widespread in various areas of the Colorado River and various tributaries of the Colorado River. The formation covers huge areas in the Western US, but it's not the only one that has gold. There are areas in and various sedimentary formations that uh, also have huge amounts of gold in them in other parts of the Western US. The uh, Snake River in Idaho and Wyoming carries free gold and nearly all the terraces of the, the gravel bars for both the Upper Columbia and the Snake River in Washington also carry fine gold. Fine gold has also been found in Utah on the bars of the Green River south of Vernal. The Arkansas River, uh, the, at least the upper part of the Arkansas River in Colorado, also carries fine free gold. All told, the drainages of these various rivers, the Green River, Snake River, uh, and, and others, cover a huge part of the western U.S. Let's take a look at how the, the gold placers form in these streams. They're called skim bars, and I have a diagram I want to show you. Getting the best gold out of these rivers, the Snake, the Columbia, uh, the Green River, parts of the Arkansas, and others, um, requires uh, some understanding of where flood gold accumulates. And this is a diagram that shows some of the best of this. Uh, it's called skim bars. And literally, 
the as the river flows and goes uh, downstream, the the bars that it forms at the head of the the deposition area, you can get these thin uh, sandy bars on top of cobbles. And you'll find the greatest gold content in these small bars. The great thing about them is that they reform after heavy waters. You get a a big runoff from a big storm or or even a heavy uh, winter runoff, spring runoff. Uh, You can get these bars reformed. You find a place where there's good gold and you can maybe come back in six months or a year and get the same gold over again. I know guys who've gone out and found areas like this and they're able to recover multiple ounces of gold every time the skim bar reforms. So take a look at this. And if you're near one of those rivers, think about going out there and finding one of these spots. On the Pacific shores of Canada and America, there are various beach placers as well, where streams dump out into the ocean and you get uh, the currents of fine placer gold along beaches. And it stretches all the way from uh, Mexico and Southern California all the way up into Alaska. Now, the most famous of this is the beach placers at Nome, but there are a number of placers all throughout, uh, like I say, the western shores of California, Oregon, Washington, up into Canada and into Alaska that carry gold. Now, not every beach does, but there's a lot of beaches along this area that carry fine gold that can be recovered. And while these placer deposits are not very useful or good for commercial operations because they they kind of form and then disappear and reform and disappear, um, they can be very worthwhile for small-scale prospectors who can show up after big storms when these placers have formed and collect some material and collect the gold out of it uh, before the placers are destroyed by the next tide. And like I say, they can be very productive. I met a couple a while back that told me they'd uh, been out near Santa Barbara in Southern California and had uh, mined in a few days time during after a storm uh, more than seven ounces of gold. I've even read the story of a guy who found more than 78 ounces of gold in 24 days from a beach near Cape Yakutaga. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it's in Alaska. And he was armed with nothing more than gold pans and shovels and that sort of thing. And like I say, the downside of beach placers and why they're not normally worked by commercial operators is because they're temporary. When you get big storms and big waves, um, what tends to happen is you get this winnowing effect. Uh, The big waves wash the lighter material out into the ocean and kind of tend to concentrate the heavy material on the surface. And you'll get this repeated action of the waves concentrating heavy materials. And so you get layers of black sand that form on the surface of the beach by basically subtraction of the lighter materials on the beach. And these layers of black sand will have heavy minerals in them and can have uh, small bits of platinum as well as gold in there. And so people, what they do is they collect these uh, black sands and then they process them and extract the gold. And if there's any platinum, extract that out of the, uh, the black sand gravels. And the funny thing is, depending on which way the storm is coming in, uh, they may form on one beach, and then the next storm, it may form on another beach, but not on that beach. It's, it, it varies, and so it, in, in some areas, you get this situation where after a storm, you may have good material here, and you may have no material here, and then next time it's great here and not there. And But it can be fairly rich. I've even heard stories of people who say that the black sand has so much gold in it sometimes that you can even see the metallic yellow on the surface of the black sand. So is gold really found everywhere in every creek and on every stream? Well, at least at this point, I can say that gold is found in a huge number of places and sometimes in places that you wouldn't really expect it to be found. And it occurs in so many different kinds of rocks. But the question is, can you really recover gold and actually get gold that you can can extract and recover for yourself out of every creek and every hillside? 
in many places the uh, source gravel the amount of gold present in it is really really small and it certainly would never be economic or worthwhile to work these super low concentrations but the truth is is that processes of erosion and cutting through uh, so a lot of times can act like a sluice box where the the streams and their processes will wash away the lighter material and concentrate the gold just and the heavy materials just like in a real sluice box and so uh, the process of erosion and uh, making um, greater plaster concentrations really is something that's important to the individual prospector the truth is that even in a relatively good, uh, relatively rich gold-bearing river, I like just say, take for example the North Fork of the Yuba in California, famous gold-bearing river, produced a lot of big nuggets, well known for many, many, many years. Um, but the truth is that most of the gravel in that river has little or no gold. I mean, you go along there and, uh, uh, you know, you might take a pan just in a random place here or there. Eh, maybe you'll get a speck. Maybe you'll get two specks. You know, there just isn't that much gold in the river. But uh, the skill of the prospector is to learn to read the river and to see those spots where the process is a river bend or a boulder sticking out into the river or some other type of thing there is going to concentrate the gold and there in that concentration that pay streak you're going to have some good gold whereas the average grade of the river is pretty small these places of natural concentration are places where honestly there may be 500 to 10,000 times more gold than there is in the river as a whole and those are the kind of places that we as prospectors seek out. Now, becoming a skilled prospector and learning more about this kind of thing is part of what, you know, becoming a successful prospector is. You need to learn to recognize these places. Let's take a look at a diagram that helps to understand some of these different processes and places in a stream. So this is a model river that was made by the Geological Survey of Canada. And basically they introduced heavy materials in there, some galena, some garnet. Um, and and it, the thing reflects how a river will, will sort materials out and concentrate the heavies. Now, the lower one is numbered. The Basically, the places where the heavy stuff concentrated is numbered. So you can see one, two, three, and four are all concentrations on the downstream side of a bend. And if you look at these, you can tell that the sharper the bend, the more the concentration. So very gentle bends don't concentrate a lot, but really sharp bends do. You can see that number three is the biggest, sharpest uh, bend in the river, and it results in the biggest, sharpest concentration. Now, five and six, these are uh, outcrops, either a dike or a ledge, something cutting across the river as a uh, blockage uh, that uh, cuts into the bedrock, cuts into the river. And you can see that at five and six, you get a small concentration both on the upstream and the downstream side of these uh, dikes or intrusions. Then seven and eight is kind of interesting. Um, the upper one, I guess, which we'd call seven is a concentration due to the bend in the river, but there's a lower one right at the mouth of the tributary that comes in there. And this is one that's overlooked by a lot of people. If you have a gold bearing tributary coming into a uh, main stream, always the tributary will be steeper than the main stream. And when the steeper flowing water hits the slower flowing water of the main river, it'll drop out heavy materials. And so you can get a really rich patch right at the mouth of a gold bearing tributary. Number nine is a depression in bedrock in the tributary. And then 10 is an interesting one. This is, it says island on the little map, but it, the same thing could happen from a big boulder. And this is a, a people look behind boulders. And one of the things to take from this is that around the edges of the boulder are the greatest concentration where the flow of the river um, meets the slow flow behind the boulder. 
um, right at that edge is where you're going to get its, the greatest concentration. Not directly behind the boulder. Uh, you get some concentration behind the boulder, but the best is right at the edge of the stream where it meets. And then 11 is another uh, bend in the river, but it's kind of a complex one. And it shows that what happens upstream is what determines what happens in the concentration downstream. Because even though uh, you have another little bend in the river, it's the main bend that makes the big difference in number 11. Now, if you want to find out more about that, uh, learning to read a river for its gold, to see those spots where the gold just naturally concentrates, I did an entire video on it, and I think that you'll find that video to be really helpful. And so I put a link to it up above here. I also put a link to it down in the description down below, and that way you can take a look at this video and learn even more about how to read a river for its natural gold concentrations. Now for hard rock deposits, the whole process of concentrating the gold actually right out of the rock um, is uh, much more different than the concentration of a placer deposit. In hard rock, it actually is a chemical process that involves dissolving the traces of gold out of one type of rock and depositing it in some place where it's much more concentrated, much richer in its gold. But this is a kind of an interesting thing because you don't think of a gold dissolving out of rock, but because of the fact that there's water all throughout the surface of the earth and even down into aquifers and other things deep within the earth, there is water that can circulate. And if it's under the right conditions of heat and the right chemistry, like having sulfur in it, it can actually dissolve the gold out of the water in small amounts. But small amounts working over a large period of time can create a big deposit. It really does take quite a bit of heat and like I say, some sulfur uh, in order to dissolve the gold. And in order to have water that's that hot, you have to keep the water under pressure so it won't boil. And deep within the earth, the water that's down there is under pressure. And so it doesn't boil, it remains water even at higher temperatures. So water between, you know, around 212 to maybe eight or 900 Fahrenheit, uh, something like 100 centigrade to 500 centigrade, that's the same range. Uh, it takes those kinds of temperatures to dissolve the gold with the sulfur out of the rock. And like I say, pressures are often up to 100 times more than what they are on the surface. And so at these high temperatures, the sulfur rich water actually can dissolve the gold and bring it into solution. And the tiny traces of gold in the rock now get taken out where they can be deposited elsewhere. And the fact that sulfur is so important is why it's very common that gold is found in deposits with sulfur minerals like pyrite or galena or so many other sulfide minerals. The sulfur that leaves the gold is also the sulfur that deposits other minerals, silver uh, sulfide minerals too. Gold is commonly found in hard rock deposits with sulfur bearing minerals. And gold deposits can be found in a variety of different types of host rocks, um, metamorphic, igneous, all different kinds of host, even occasionally sedimentary. Uh, but gold can be found in just a variety of different host rocks, and it all depends on the other geologic conditions, faulting, fracturing, you know, intrusions of uh, nearby rocks that provide heat. All these factors combine together to make a hard rock gold deposit. And the faults are actually super important because you know, even with the high temperatures and high pressures, water doesn't really flow through rocks very well. It's, it's, you know, it's difficult. And that's why water wants to flow in things like cracks or fault zones where the rock has been broken. And the pore space between the broken fragments of rock provide the area for the gold to flow into and have a chance to eventually cool and deposit gold and quartz and sulfide minerals and other things into whether it's a vein or other type of deposit, into a hard rock type of deposit. 
most are in most deposits a lot of deposits the gold and the water comes from meteoric water basically uh, rainwater that's percolated down into rock but there's also uh, magma sources a lot of different kinds of, of molten rock that as it comes close to the surface maybe not close enough to actually erupt on the surface as a lava but the magma the molten rock comes up and a lot of different types of magma can have significant steam in them and you know it's it's water and that water can contribute or combine with the meteoric waters and become part of the system that carries the gold because hot water is so important let's take a look at a couple of videos i shot a while back and talk about this further this is a series of videos that i shot at yellowstone uh, national park a couple of years ago but it really shows how an area underlain by a volcanic rocks or other hot rock that isn't necessarily erupting on the surface can with water make huge changes to the area and of course this is an area where there's geysers and things all over the place uh, steaming rocks and then the white stuff on the surface this is silica it's it's a fine-grained quartz but it's uh it's silica deposited by hot water nonetheless and sometimes the hot water comes to the surface, it doesn't erupt as steam, but they'll just be heavy pools of, you know, hot water steaming and that sort of thing. And, you know, is there really uh, gold and silver deposits being created uh, deep under Yellowstone? Well, it's the right kind of environment, the right kind of geology. Of course, it would be, you know, a half a mile or a mile down. And so, you know, it, it's not something that is going to come to the surface easily. But if you look around through the area, you know, you take a panorama, there really is uh, steaming, you know, vents and stuff like that in pre pretty much any direction. And this would be probably what a lot of mining districts would look like when they were under their formation. So that's a little bit about, you know, hard rock gold and where it comes from. So in the final analysis, can you really find recoverable gold everywhere? Is there really gold in every creek and on every hillside? Well, you know, there may be traces, but is it recoverable? Is it something you as a prospector could actually get out of that rock and put in a bottle or, you know, save somehow? And I would have to say that, you know, the tiny traces that are in most rocks are totally uneconomic and not something that can be recovered by a prospector with a pan or a sluice box or dry washer or any type of normal prospecting equipment. Even cyanide leaching these rocks isn't going to be something that produces usable amounts of gold. So if you're asking about can you find recoverable amounts of gold in every creek and on every hillside, I'd have to say that that myth is busted. You know, there's, it's really, there's districts and places where you can find gold and knowing how to find gold and where the gold naturally concentrates makes you a better prospector and makes you better able to find it. But the tiny traces that are everywhere are really not something that's interesting to the prospector or to the geologist. It's not something that you can actually get some gold out of that you could take that, you know, that would be something that would add up. It, it's not recoverable. It's just the tiny traces that maybe are there with some potential that in the right geologic circumstance sometime in the future, maybe some of that gold could be concentrated into a natural concentration that would be usable and interesting to geologists and to prospectors. So seeking after those tiny part per billion you know, a few part per billion types of traces is not something that, you know, is really going to be of interest to the prospector. It's looking for those natural concentrations that whether they be placer concentrations of n dust and nuggets or whether they're hard rock vein type concentrations with free gold. And, you know, those things can be really fascinating and can be very profitable. But seeking after a half a part per billion in some rock, 
you know, it's just not worth anybody's time. And knowing how to find those real concentrations, the natural concentrations, whether it be placer or be hard rock, that's the skill of the prospector. That's what makes a prospector successful. That's why some guys find so much more gold than others, because they know how to read rivers, they know how to uh, see hard rock veins and understand how they form and where the gold is gonna be. And now, if you have any interest in being one of the successful prospectors, one of the folks who can go out and find some own, their own gold for themselves uh, and know where the places you shouldn't look are and where the places that you should look are. Yeah, I wrote a book about that called Fistful of Gold. And that book is written to transfer to you the knowledge and experience that I've gained in more than 40 years of finding my own gold. Transfer that information to you so that you can become a successful prospector in your own right. My book is called Fistful of Gold, because that's what I want you to find. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So this is my book, Fistful of Gold. You can see it's an encyclopedia distilling down my 45 plus years of prospecting experience plus my degree into the parts that you need to know. I spent most of 10 years writing this. It was not just a simple effort that, uh, oh, I sat down and wrote it. You can see it's like a quarter of a million words. It's not something you're going to read through in a day or maybe even a week or more. But it's got a lot of information and reference material that you can come back to. You know, you can read it once and read it again and get more out of it because there's just that much depth of material in this. I wrote this book because I want you to have the skills to go out and find fistfuls of gold for yourself. And if you have the skills and know what you're doing and get out in the field and make a real effort, you can find significant gold. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you that because, you know, gold, it, it wouldn't be, you know, close to $2,000 an ounce, which is what it is right now. It wouldn't be so expensive if it was easy to find. It's not easy. You just can't walk out into an old gold field and start picking up nuggets. If the, if the gold was easy to see and find, the old timers would have picked it up and taken it themselves. So you got to have skill. You got to know what you're doing. You got to be able to, to master what it takes to find gold. And you've got to have the persistence and put in the effort to find the material, to find the gold or diamonds or gemstones that you're looking for. Now, this has book has geology, it has facts about gold, it has stuff about diamonds and platinum, but it's mostly about gold, gold deposits, how gold deposits form, how placer and nuggets form, you know, all the questions you've probably wanted to ask. The book is available on Amazon, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, but you can look up on Amazon, This Full of Gold, and, by Chris Ralph, and find this book. Now, the book, if you look on it, it has a very high rating. It has like a 4.7 or 4.8 out of 5, which is really high. I mean, it's hard to please everybody, but I'm close to a 5 out of 5. Not far from it, right? So it's been out. I've sold more than 15,000 copies of this book, and I've had tremendous response, tremendous positive response by the people who buy it. And I think if you buy it, you'll be just as happy with it. Now, in addition to my book, I also have a website that I do. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my website and show you some images from the website right now. Now, my website is NevadaOutbackGems.com, and I'll put a link to the prospecting page, this prospecting encyclopedia page, down in the description below, but you can find it at Nevada Outback Gems. Uh, I sell some jewelry, turquoise, other gemstones there. Uh, I don't always keep the uh, inventory perfectly up to date, so if you're interested in anything you see, do contact me first before trying to send me money or anything, because I want you to be able to get what you order. But the website has lots of different stories, old adventures, uh, even some stories, uh, true stories from the old time miners of the 1800s. So I think it's uh, something you'll find interesting. The other thing I want to go back to is that 
all my comments, I want you guys to ask questions on the comments for my videos. I answer 100% of the comments that are made on my videos. Now, sometimes if somebody just says, hey, great video, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, the comment may just be, well, I'm really glad you liked it. Uh, or, or, you know, if it's a simple question. Um, and, and sometimes I get people who ask me questions, I would take a book to answer that question. And I recommend that they just buy the book. But I answer all my questions. I try to help people as much as I can. I'm here to help you. So if you're interested in gaining the skills, if you're interested in knowing what you need to know to be successful, follow along with me. Subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so that they'll let you know when I come out with new videos. And I try to do that pretty much every Saturday morning. And you'll enjoy with me. You'll come along with me. We'll have an adventure together. And we will find some nice gold and see what it's really like getting out in the woods or the deserts or the mountains, wherever we land, wherever the gold is, wherever the diamonds are, wherever the platinum is. Come along. We'll have some fun. And I'll see you real soon on the next video.